part two video podcast uh, for field methods in hydrology related to precipitation measurement and sampling. In the first part, I tried to cover some of the basic concepts about precipitation that I thought would be relevant to what you need to know before we start measuring it. Um, now I want to talk about the specifics of the measurement technologies available for measuring precipitation. Before I do that, though, I need to get cover one topic um, that will be spanning all the information about different kinds of sensors that we use. Now, when you buy a sensor because you want to measure something, usually the sensor comes and it's going to say, okay, here's how much rain there is, here's what the depth of water is, you know, whatever it is that you're buying it for, it's usually going to tell you that. Um, but in fact, it isn't natively measuring that. It's measuring something that's an indicator, like a voltage, and then uh, it's converting that through something that we call a calibration. <clears throat> Later in the quarter, when we look at water quality sensors, I'll show you more of the details of how that plays out, uh, as well as when we cover pressure transducers. But I just want to start giving you a sense of what calibration is all about and why it's important. When a company calibrates their sensor to provide the output that, it, that it's supposed to measure, like precipitation, um, sometimes they'll just give you a generic equation that is supposed to apply for all sensors, but other times they'll give you a specific equation to apply to that individual sensor. And that's the better outcome because every individual sensor has slightly unique behavior because there are what we call tolerances in the construction of any hardware so that no two sensors will do exactly the same thing. So when you buy something off the shelf or you borrow something or you, know, you, you just have a sensor or it's been you know, sitting on a shelf for a while or a new person comes into your group that you're, you, you want to use a sensor, it's really important to go through a calibration process to test how the sensor is performing and to give the person who's going to use it good experience with uh, how it works. Because um, when somebody understands something very thoroughly and knows the range of conditions of how it operates, then they're just going to do better at managing, operating, and analyzing stuff associated with that sensor. Um, okay, now, of course, some sensors are so complex in what they measure, for example, an acoustic Doppler velocity profiler, that um, there's just no way that you can go out in the field or create a laboratory setting that measures exactly what it's going to measure. Or at least the cost to do so and the time involved would be so prohibitive that it isn't worthwhile. Um, usually in cases like that, the factory has already done a lot of calibration and you can trust it. But if it's at all feasible to do that, I would just consider it part of the operating expense of a business or a necessary action in, in a research setting um, to, to go ahead and do calibrations and testing. So the approach is that you put the sensor into whatever it's going to measure. It could be, you could use a rain simulator, which could even be a faucet, um, or you know, a water depth chamber of some kind, you know, velocity, whatever it is. You create a laboratory setting or use a simple field setting where you can have the sensor generate a signal then you have to have a means of measuring the value at the same time by an independent approach. Usually it's by controlling <coughs> the force that you're, you're implementing, you know, whatever that the driver of the signal is. Like if you have a faucet, you can independently measure the water coming out of the faucet by some other thing. And so that gets into the problem, you know, what if that's not as good as the sensor itself? So that's something you have to figure out. Um, but assuming you can measure it better, you know, accurately by an independent method, then you make a plot with a, on the x-axis you want what the sensor says, and on the y-axis you want the true value as, as best as you can know it by the independent method. Uh, and then what you're doing is you're seeing if there's a you know a relationship between the two. There should be a relationship at least. Ideally, it should be one to one. That is to say that the exact same value for the sensor should be um, the true value, and it also should have an intercept of zero. So if the sensor says zero, the actual value is zero. So it should be a linear relationship with a slope of 1 and an intercept of 0. But of course, that's not going to be the case. It should still be a linear function, but it may not be. 
And so when you get the equation from, you know, like a least squares regression or some other appropriate best fitting method, then you can use that equation to take x, which is the sensor value, and convert it to y, which is the accurate observed value from the independent method. So I don't have this from a rain data, but I did do a study where I was measuring water over a bed, and we were measuring the lift induced by um, the turbulent flows over the bed. And instead of measuring it as a force, we were measuring it as a moment, which is a force carried over a distance. Uh, so we had the sensor moment. Uh, the x-axis shows the value that the sensor was giving. The y-axis shows the actual values that we observed. And we, we actually observe this by imposing it with, with um, you know, store-brought calibration weights and applying those weights on moment arms so we knew exactly what we were getting. And what you can see here are two data sets. There's the one-to-one -one line, which is the line with the, uh, okay, with the one-to-one -one line there, right? Uh, then there's the um, sensor value, the raw sensor readings, which are shown with the X with uh, the square around it. And you can see it's deviating. So the, the sensor is reading a higher value than the actual moment. Then you get this equation, which is the difference between the two, and you can see that you have to take the x value and scale it down by about 77%, or, well, scale it down by 33%, um, although it is very close to a, a y-intercept of zero. And you can see that the r squared is per, near perfect, so it is a very strong line, but it's just deviating from one to one. After we apply this equation, then you get the result that is shown by the circle. So it's not perfect, but it's dramatically improved. And if I plot the error, the error, the raw error of the sensor ranges from 24 to like 30, what, 6%, um, whereas after calibration, it's 0 to what, 2, 4, you know, 5%, something like that. Also, it's very common that sensors perform worse for low values. Um, compared to high values. And usually the accuracy of a sensor is reported as a percent of the full range. So if this is a full range of 10 Newton meters, then you know something that's accurate to 1% would be accurate to <coughs> 0.1. Or if it's accurate to 10%, it would be 1. So um, even after calibration, you're still not going to have a perfect outcome, but you can see it's dramatically improved, and that's why it's important. Okay, so this concept will apply to everything we do and so I just want to start off and present that to you and now we can move on to look at the rain gauges in particular. So as if calibration wasn't bad enough, I have some really sad news for you. As important as rainfall or other kinds of precipitation are, the reality is it's extremely difficult to accurately measure. And I want to read you a quote from a paper from the journal Water Resources Research in 1999 from a really good group of rainfall scientists. And so it's a lengthy quote, it takes two slides, but it's really important to read. There is no easy way to know how much rain reaches the ground at any instant and location or for a given storm. All instruments designed to measure rainfall, either directly or indirectly, in situ or remotely, suffer to various degrees from different sources of uncertainty. Just think about that. Think about how you turn on the news all the time or you, you go online and you say, gee, okay, there's two inches of rain today. There's this much rain today. Like, as a society, we take for granted that we can measure the amount of rainfall. It's just not even a question. This is a key to you that throughout this course and from now on in the rest of your professional lives, do not take anything you hear without, with regard to measurement as truth. Measurements can be full of error, uncertainty, or they can be flat out wrong. This is your call to arms to become a skeptic. Don't believe anybody, anything, any measurement, any model, any theory until you thoroughly thought through it and vetted it. Okay, that's really important, okay? In the end, you need to be convinced through reason and information, facts, that something is trustworthy. Okay, let's continue the quote. Rain gauges provide a direct measurement of rainfall at a given point. However, they may suffer from deficiencies in the collection mechanism and unsatisfactory sighting. In particular, we found the tipping bucket rain gauges, and as an aside, I'm going to show you those in a few moments, 
are prone to malfunctioning due to biological fouling or occasional human interference. Now on the issue of human interference, wherever you put things in the field, the number one likely outcome is someone's going to steal it or break it or play with it. It's really frustrating, but that is the reality of field work. For only three of the 30 selected storms, all the gauges were working properly, while for two storms, the number of reliable gauges dropped to 50%. For 80% of the storms investigated, approximately 70% of the rain gauges performed reasonably well. Not bad. None of the gauges worked perfectly all of the time during a two-year period. They also encountered problems with another device called a distrometer. Okay, and then radar observations, which we're not going to cover in this course, but they provide coverage for a large area, but you know they also have problems with hail, bright band signal contamination, anomalous propagation, ground returns, range effects, variability in hydrometer size distribution, among other problems. So um, this is a little bit of a call to arms here. Now, what do you do about it? That doesn't mean that you just give up and go home. Okay, there, there is stuff that we can do. Um, and that means that we have to have quality control one way or another. One way to do that, built in redundancy in the network design so that you can cross check the error. Now, when I hear built in redundancy, you just think, cha ching, this is going to be expensive. Okay, instead of doing everything once, now we're talking about doing everything two, three, four, or five times and with different ways. And how are you going to determine what's the best answer? But let's see what this says. So rain gauges, especially tipping bucket gauges, are prone to malfunction. Thus, when designing a rain gauge network, redundancy is the key to obtaining high quality rain gauge data. So if there is like mission critical location and it only costs a couple hundred bucks, why would you settle for one? Don't put your future into the hands of one thing. Uh, you know, whether you're blasting off to the moon or whatever, redundancy is the name of the game in, in science. If you need critical me measurements, they're mission critical, you need to have redundancy. Wherever possible, we suggest setting up clusters of at least three rain gauges within a few hundred meters or less and spreading those clusters throughout the domain of interest. Now when it comes to the spacing, I'm going to come back and talk more about this in a, in a, in a spatial experimental design presentation, but um, just something to think about how that spread might need to look like. Such a design appears superior to a network of evenly distributed gauges because the close by gauges permit cross checking to detect malfunctioning. Now this is a little bit counterintuitive or at least a different, a different focus. If you want to focus on optimizing your cost to get the most benefit, you would never want to have redundancy. Having two or more sensors close to each other um, you know, it is seems like a waste of money. However, what this quote is telling us is that we just can't trust the values of any one sensor, so you do need redundancy. Each cluster of rain gauges should include buried and or above ground tipping bucket and or accumulation gauges. Okay, well I think we've made that point clearly, so now what are the kinds of gauges and <clears throat> what are their pros and cons and costs, how do they work and so forth. Uh, the topic of this presentation, since it's field methods, is going to be point measurement methods. That is that we're going to observe the amount of rainfall accumulated over a set interval of time with primarily an 8-inch diameter collector. 8-inch diameter is the standard collector for the National Weather Service, and it's what we use in hydrology. Um, of course, you need to then take those sensors and establish a network suitable to get the spatial coverage for whatever phenomenon you, you need. And how often you collect is going to depend on, again, what are the questions that you have relative to the concepts from the first part of this presentation. Uh, and then finally, there, these are the types that I'm going to cover. Non-recording, accumulation or manual gauges as they're called, um, tipping bucket rain gauges, weighing gauges, optical gauge, or also called an astronomer, and depth sensors. Non-recording gauge, this is the, you know, the workhorse of measurement in remote locations that are not going to be um, <clears throat> requiring continuous observations, um, but you know, maybe de depending on the cost of labor, someone might be going out once a day, once a week, something like that. 
So what happens here is you, you can see in the photo the complete setup shown with the stand. This could also be located in the ground or above ground. Um, and what it consists of is the outer casing, which has the 8-inch diameter, and then the outer funnel that goes on top of that. So when rain falls down, it hits the funnel, and it all comes together into a 2-inch diameter cylinder. Okay, then that two inch diameter cylinder, like that funnel there, connects to the long two inch diameter cylinder here. This cylinder is inside the eight inch diameter cylinder. It just sits inside there, and, uh, and that's the whole setup. So why are we taking an eight inch diameter can and funneling all the water to a two inch diameter cylinder? You may wanna pause and think about that for a second. The reason that we do that uh, is because with a if you have a relatively light rainstorm and you only have you have this eight inch diameter can, you can imagine you're going to get a very very thin uh, you know depth of of water accumulated. So by taking an eight inch can and funneling it into two inches, you're essentially amplifying the signal because you'll get a greater depth per unit volume. So this is the first indication of a range resolution trade-off, and this is a double range kind of sensor. Um, the range is the total amount of water that this can handle, and the small range is determined by the volume of this cylinder. Um, the resolution is determined by you know, how finely can you observe changes in, in depth, and that's measured with this graduated measuring stick and usually the stick is already incremented in rainfall, assuming it's being measured within this two inch diameter cylinder. However, if you just get inundated over the between periods of observations, if you were to spill out of here and you had no other container, then you would lose the sample and you wouldn't know how much you got. By nesting this inside a bigger can, now you have uh, the ability to go up to 20 inches of rain total that you can accumulate. So um, that gives you, you know, quite a substantial amount. Is it possible to exceed it? Yes, it is. But that gives you a pretty wide range while still having a better resolution by having this finer scale uh, cylinder inside of it. Okay, so the basic method, it rains into the funnel, it accumulates in the two inch diameter tube, then that fills up. You take a dry stick, you put it in, take it out, the stick is wet where the water is, so you look at the line, and you just simply read to the nearest one hundredth of an inch of rain uh, how much is there. And so your final result could be something like 1.34 inches. So if it rains less than uh, a hundredth of an inch, then you won't record anything. Or if the time between observations allows that to evaporate, then you may not see it either. Um, note that these are all English units because that's what's used in the United States, unfortunately. But this is also available in millimeters, and that's typically um, what you see in the rest of the world. Some of the details in citing a gauge here, um, the main impacts you have to worry about are wind related or the role of obstructions. So if there's something like a tree, so imagine on this triangle that the vertical line is a tree, then um, the, the goal is to have the sensor more than twice the distance away that that obstruction is tall. So if you're a 10 foot high tree, the sensor should be 20 feet or more away. The price for a non-recording gauge, if it's plastic, is about $300. If it's steel, it could be you know fifteen hundred or two thousand dollars. Why would you want steel? Because steel is inert, and if you want to do chemical analyses of one kind or another, then you have to have the container um, be independent in terms of its chemistry from whatever it is you want to measure in the water. So if you want to measure inorganic constituents, plastic is fine. If you want to measure uh, organic constituents, you don't want plastic, you'd want steel. So the pros uh, for non-recording gauges, always I always begin with simple and cheap. That's always important, Dep you know, depending on the setting you're in, it, it often may be adequate. Um, also, this is a sampling method. You have the water, 
you can you can store it and save it for chemical analysis the main negative is that it's not recording so you have to go out you know it's labor intensive um, and you're only getting the net the difference between what you see now and your last observation as opposed to something that would automatically record the results and the effect of wind is really important um, here are some simulations that show wind around a rain gauge, and this is the funnel in the middle. Um, red indicates high velocities, blue low velocities, and the wind is blowing from left across to right. And here's a, a 3D visualization with showing the velocity streamlines around that. Um, but you can really see how uh, there's very high velocities over the top of this sensor, and so um, you know, given the complexity of that flow field, then there may be problems with the rain actually going into the funnel. And so uh, as a result of that, there's a windshield that you can buy and set up around the sensor um, that helps to prevent that from being a problem. Okay, so the next technology is called a tipping bucket recording rain gauge. The way this works is you still have an 8-inch funnel, so that's the same across the top, but now the funnel comes down to a much, much smaller diameter. And that funnel goes to a little seesaw. The seesaw is contained of two cups that are triangular in shape. Uh, you have to think of it in this, this vertical position. Uh, the bottom is here, the top is here, and the cup fills up with water. When the cup fills up with just enough water to equal the minimum measurement increment you want, which could be one millimeter of rain or a hundredth of an inch of rain, um, just depending on you know whatever whatever it is for the sensor that's going to be, then um, then it will tip over. Then it will tip, and when it tips, this red magnet hits this reed switch, and you get a, a single click, and then um, that goes to a data logger or gauge of some kind. And all that it's doing is is just counting the number of clicks that happen. Every time it clicks, um, it counts those up. And you could store number of clicks per minute. You could store the time of each click. Each click represents that minimum interval. As you can imagine, one of the key factors in, of error here is the calibration that in fact this is what it says it is. So if it's is it really 0 0.01 inches? And that's something that you can test. If you can independently measure out that minimum volume of water and then gently fill the cup and see if it does tip. Okay, how how precise is that? <coughs> uh, tipping bucket rain gauges can be as cheap as two hundred dollars if they're all plastic. Uh, or they can be as much as $1,500 or more if they're all steel. Um, the main advantage is this is fairly accurate. It's measuring rain intensity, which is what we want. Um, there's, there's several disadvantages to this technology. If you don't get enough rain to tip the bucket, then um, it won't, obviously it won't record. If it evaporates away, then you just, you just don't see it. However, if the water sits in there for a little while, then the next storm comes along and you already have that antecedent moisture so it would be tipping prematurely relative to that event. It's basically saying that um, the first tip of a storm is accumulating what happened since the last tip on the last storm. Now the other end of the spectrum is what happens if you have a really really high tipping you know, uh, rainfall rate and we'll, we'll play with this the sensor in the in the you know together and you'll see how this works but basically if this thing is just going tip 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 okay it can only tip so fast rain can come in faster so that it actually overfills before it can tip and in that case then you would be underestimating the precipitation and so for very very high intensities then it will perform poorly the last time it performs poorly is for snow. This sensor is not designed for snow unless it has a heating element and it's metal. So if this is metal and the snowflakes fall on it, it quickly melts and then runs in, then you could get it. But, you know, the rain, I'm sorry, the, the snow rate of precipitation, uh, it has to allow for that melting to take place. If it's not a heated gauge, then 
all that would happen is the snow would just accumulate in the funnel, pile up, and it would block the whole thing up and it wouldn't work. And so that leads to the solution to that problem, which is called a weighing recording gauge. So this is just putting the bucket on a weight scale, and whatever falls into the bucket, um, you would see the weight increasing through time, and you could convert that to a precipitation rate. Um, you know, you could imagine that if you have a a uh, a bare pan and you know rain can splash a lot, that could be a problem. But you know, you would just use a funnel over this, just like you would for anything else, an eight-inch funnel. Um, this can handle snow, so if you, if, you know, with, without a funnel, you could just have the snow falling right into the pan and it would be catching that. It isn't common to see this, but it is possible. And these can also be heated as well. Uh, and you can see that uh, since they essentially have a, a bucket here, then you're collecting a sample. Notice that with a tipping gauge, um, the water drains out through these drain holes. If you wanted to collect a sample, you would have to put some kind of bag or, or other you know, collector below that to catch the water as it comes through the drain hole. There are a few other types of rain gauges. Uh, another thing you could do is instead of having a manual stick to record, you could simply put in what we call a pressure transducer or bubbler or other kind of way of measuring height. Um, and we'll co cover that later on in the class when we get to pressure transducers and measuring depths. But you could, you could do it that way. Um, you know, if you were in a remote location and that's what you had and you didn't want to uh, limit the sampling interval, then you could do that. And then the last one is what's called an optical rain gauge, also known as a distrometer. In this case, you have a beam, so like a source of light, and then on the other end, you have a detector. And so then that's going across, and as raindrops pass through that beam, and usually that beam is a sheet, okay? So it may start off at a point, but it spreads out as a sheet. As rain passes down through that, it's going to alter the properties of what the detector is receiving and it will be able to assess aspects of that precipitation. And if you take two of these together, so here you have two light sources in this case coming out as a sheet and then being detected as this line scan cameras. These are at 90 degrees angle and they're not like right on top of each other, they're offset. And then that creates a position so it's going to go through you know, source one and then hit source two, and so that allows you to get velocities and shapes and a whole bunch of other information. Okay, so that's the information on precipitation gauges. We'll be playing with um, those sensors in class, and um, you know we'll be taking a look at that relative to the snow sensors and other things.